Yes, I am very pessimistic, but um, I, I was pessimistic prematurely before my time. I was pessimistic 20 years ago when everybody was optimistic. Not in Russia, of course. Pessimism was rife in Russia 20 years ago. But in my part of the world, which you're in today, the West, uh, was one of the most optimistic uh, times that I can remember in my lifetime. It's now one of the most pessimistic times. And let me just quote uh, from uh, the Munich Security Conference uh, report. Every year at Munich, in September usually, uh, February, sorry, the uh, leaders of the world meet. Vladimir Putin has, uh, is a regular attender. Uh, and they discuss the state of the world, which I'm going to do this afternoon. And what I have to say will be subjective because I'm going to look at the things that interest me most. And I am a security person. And as I said to somebody sitting next to me uh, during the, the session, you do too much geopolitics in Russia. We do too little geopolitics in the West. And we've just woken up to the fact that we have to start talking geopolitics for the first time for a long time. In this security report from last year, uh, you will find this uh, statement, that a historic era is coming to an end, that the outlines of a new political age are beginning to emerge. But we don't know what that new political age is going to look like. And that is why we in the West, who are stakeholders, in the international order. It's our international order. We built it in the late 1940s and early 1950s. We feel that we are facing an existential crisis. Now, the term existential crisis, I take from the European Union's strategic, a grand global strategy report of 2016. We live in times of existential crisis. And what's fascinating about that report is to compare it with the very first one in 2003, the very first time the EU had a global strategy report, which opens, the preamble of this report opens with the wonderful words, Europe has never been safer. So a lot can happen in 15 years. And one of the reasons I want to give this talk today is to explain why the Europeans uh, feel very unsafe in the world in which we find ourselves. Now let's just go back to uh, 2019. I, I was in Berlin on the anniversary, 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, at a conference organized by Chatham House, amongst others. And in my uh, session, I determined to be a party pooper and tell them that, in fact, the fall of the Berlin Wall was not historically as significant as we might think. I, I was arguing that there was a far more significant date and that date was 1979, 10 years before, when two things happened that completely transformed the international landscape in a way that the end of the Cold War did not. One was the Iranian Revolution, which radically transformed the face of the Middle East. And the second was the decision of the Chinese government to open its markets to the world. And just remember, in 1979, the Chinese economy was marginally larger than Spain's. Today, the Chinese economy, in purchasing parity terms, is larger than that of the United States, although it's, I think in real terms it's quite far behind still. And the other thing about the collapse of the Berlin Wall is what didn't happen. Because for the collapse of communism to have really made a significant difference, to the international order, two things would have had to have happened. Russia would have had to have joined the international order, which is what we hoped would actually happen, and what Gorbachev, of course, always hoped would happen, that Russia would become part uh, of, a liberal of the liberal international order, not the Western international order, but the liberal international order. He is one of the most disappointed people, of course, of all in the twilight of his life. And the second thing is that the world order that the West had created would be stronger 30 years later, rather than weaker 30 years later, as it actually is. Uh, to quote the Germany's foreign minister, uh, we felt comfortable in the old world order. We no longer feel comfortable, because the old world order is beginning to crumble and disintegrate. 
So, just to remind you uh, of two things. Uh, first, Islam and the Iranian Revolution. And what happened on September the 11th in New York, of course, was not the responsibility of the Iranian government, but those young uh, terrorists were undoubtedly inspired by what had happened in Iran in 1979, in the same way that young radicals were inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution for a long time after it became clear that the Soviet Union uh, was no longer a workable <coughs> proposition. And what happened, of course, after 9-11 was the United States massively overreacted to the events of that day and spelt, uh, spent about $3.7 trillion trying to change the face of the greater Middle East. And that's more money in a war, it was called the Global War on Terror, than the United States has fought throughout its history. It's more money than it's fought on every other war, including the Second World War, put together. And what does it have to show for this massive commitment, financial commitment? Very little. In fact, the Middle East, I would suggest today, is in a far worse situation than it was before the events of 9-11. And we have the events uh, of Afghanistan, a war which is now in its 19th year. And there is absolutely no prospect of success today any more than there was 19 years ago. Now that's a situation. And then we have the rise of China. And I just quote, not quote, but just give you the description of China by the United States and by the European Union. Description of China last year as America's major strategic threat, the major strategic threat of the future. And the description of China by the European Union last year as the European Union's chief systemic threat. The threat, in fact, to the European project and what the European Union wants to achieve in Europe itself. So let me just go through five, I think, major changes that we are living through and that we should take note of. The first is that we are heading into a world of global competition. Great power conflict is back for which the West is unprepared. And that's a quotation from the American national security strategy of last year. It's partly unprepared because it hasn't been true to its own first principles. It hasn't respected international law and it hasn't backed up its own rules-based order. And here I'm going to be very critical of the United States but I shall also be very critical of Russia, by the way, in a few moments' time. So it's a kind of level playing field. Well, what I'm talking about, not being responsible for international law, there was a famous press conference on the second day of the Iraq war in 2003, when President Bush was asked, do we have international law on our side? And he said, oops, I hadn't thought of that. I'd better ring my lawyer and find out. Well, that was a joke, uh, as it turned out, a rather poor joke in the uh, light of circumstances. But it was this idea that we don't need international law on our side that has unfortunately driven a lot of Western interventionism. Wes Clark, who was the uh, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO uh, in the 1990s, uh, wrote a piece last year in which he revealed that the United States was thinking of attacking seven different countries after 9-11. Not just Iraq, but seven different countries, six other countries that it held to be responsible implicitly or explicitly for what had happened on 9-11. And that degree of arrogance, uh, hegemonic arrogance, which was made possible, of course, by the end of the Cold War, is something which we're paying for now. And one of the major, I think, commentators uh, who I respect, uh, Professor Steve Walt at Harvard, has written that the United States is still suffering from what he called hegemonic hubris. We mentioned the word hubris this morning. It is not yet ready for an era of post-hegemonic cooperation. So basically, my bottom line is that the United States is powerful enough to act unilaterally, 
but is no longer powerful enough to be the hegemonic power. And that it is, has not yet come to terms with that reality. The second is uh, American unilateralism, which these days is actually more economic than anything else, particularly under a President Trump, who doesn't really believe in imperial adventures, doesn't like expeditionary warfare, has called his generals to their face uh, uh, losers for their inability to win in Afghanistan. What the United States has done is to engage in a, a large element of economic warfare, <coughs> partly weaponizing the dollar, very important. Now, sure, there was a 2008 financial crisis, but the crisis reinforced the role of the dollar in the world. The dollar became more powerful after 2008 than it was before. And the Federal Reserve in the United States transformed itself into a global leader of last resort. The dollar is the only major international currency, and it is used to punish countries that stand uh, out of line, step out of line. Sanctions. This is Donald Trump's preferred weapon, the use of economic sanctions. Not stealth fighters, not cruise missiles, not those aircraft carriers, each one of which, by the way, costs almost $15 billion. It's sanctions. And if you want to see how effective sanctions can be, look at the state of the Iranian economy at the moment and the pressures that are building up there. And finally, there is an economic cold war beginning between the United States and China. Uh, it's an economic cold war defined by silicon chips and digital data and big discussions about G5 and where that's going. Russia, of course, is going with Chinese G5. So are a number of other European countries. This country has to make a decision probably this week as to whether to go with the Chinese or to step aside and say no. So here we are. Uh, we have uh, a situation where the United States, as I feel, not acted true to its own first principles, and that's not just Donald Trump or George W. Bush. It was in the Obama administration as well. And then you see, and this is my second point, the breakdown of the uh, Western alliance system. Not the breakdown, but it's being given a stress test, definitely, because there's an idea of conditionality. Partnerships are these days conditional. The United States wants from its allies limited commitments, uh, limited purposes, and limited times, which has led the Estonian president to say to the United States, why don't you just bill us for the presence of your soldiers in Europe? Just hand us the bill, because that is your attitude towards NATO. And by the way, the United States has billed countries before, in 1991, it billed two countries, Japan and Saudi Arabia, for fighting the first Gulf War on behalf of the United Nations. The Japanese raised a special tax to pay for that war. The Saudi Arabians paid a cash settlement to the United States. And I think when you look around the world, you will see America's allies reassessing their options. Turkey, definitely. Uh, Japan, well, Japan is trying to build up a better relationship with Russia to hedge against what it sees as a declining commitment by the United States. Israel and South, uh, Saudi Arabia are practically, uh, I would say, independent of the United States. They do basically what they want to do, and the United States allows them to do that. India is determinedly non-aligned and doesn't want to be too closely associated with the West, although it is becoming increasingly fearful of China. So what you see is a Western alliance system which is under pressure, and that makes it very difficult for the West to shore up this world order that is largely Western in origin. Thirdly, we move to China. And China is not directly challenging the United States, but it has uh, given notification that it intends to do so 
and to do so sooner rather than later. I think what's important here is that China has set uh, a new uh, direction in international politics. We no longer clash over ideologies. We're all capitalists here. We clash over identities and cultural values. And China has staked out a role for itself as a, a civilization state. At the 19th Party Congress, it declared itself to be a civilization state. President Putin, by the way, at the Valdai meeting some years ago, said that Russia was a civilizational state. Uh, Narendra Modi in India has made no secret of the fact that he wants India to be a Hindu civilizational state. The language that we're all talking today, is the currency of international politics, is now culture. And that's important. Uh, Prime Minister Abe in Japan, a close ally of Donald Trump, has said that he wants to reinvigorate Japanese nationalism and is trying to reintroduce into Japanese schools textbooks from the 1930s that were banned by the Americans when they occupied Japan in 1945. Modi refers to the great Mughal moment in Indian history as a period of Muslim occupation of India by a foreign power. Uh, President uh, Putin has talked about a civilizational clash between Europe and Russia, a civilizational clash. Viktor Orban has said that there is within the European Union, or there are, two Europes, an Islamic Europe, i.e. France and other countries like that with significant Muslim populations, <laughs> and countries like Hungary and Poland that are standing up for what he calls a Christian Europe. Wherever you look, you will find that the currency of international politics is culture. And there was an interesting article by the Charlemagne correspondent in The Economist two, two or three weeks ago asking, can the European Union be a civilization state? Is that the end objective to which the European Union should be moving? I would argue, by the way, that democratic societies cannot be civilizational states by definition, and that it's hopeless to imagine, it's even undesirable, to imagine that the European Union would be one. Now, some of you in this audience, knowing about uh, Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, this thesis that was put forward by a Harvard professor so many years ago in a book which has been translated into 60 different languages and which is still the most important book on international relations to have been published uh, since the Cold War in terms of the debate about where we're heading. Whether you agree with the thesis or not is, uh, is immaterial. It is discussed all the time. It was discussed in 9-11 because bin Laden believed in it and had read the book. It's discussed whenever there's a clash between uh, different uh, societies. It's discussed in Iran these days because there are many Iranians who've read the book and believe that Huntingdon was right. And what's happening is a clash between the West and the Islamic world. Well, that is not my opinion, of course, uh, and I don't believe uh, that it's true. But it was the opinion of one of the Trump administration's uh, people, the director of policy planning in the State Department. She didn't survive very long because people don't survive very long in the Trump administration. <laughs> Karen Skinner, who said that in China we are facing a clash of the kind that this country has never faced before. We are facing a threat from a non-Caucasian power. She forgot about the Second World War and the Imperial Japan, which was also a non-Caucasian power. But she said that the Cold War with the Soviet Union was a family dispute within the same family, within the same value system and the same culture. But this is not, she said it was a clash shaping up a clash of civilizations. Well, we're not seeing a clash of civilizations. What we're seeing is a clash of political systems, liberalism, if you want to call it that, and authoritarianism. President Putin, in his famous uh, interview with the Financial Times, said that liberalism is dying, 
if not dead, that authoritarianism is the future. So that's one contest which we're facing. And the other is a clash of economic models, both of which are capitalist, but one is what we call free market, and the other is what we call command economies, uh, with a large element of the free market, but essentially economies that are controlled. We use the term control this morning a lot by governments. And I think what we're seeing is a new economic Cold War, which is beginning to emerge. And countries are being posed with the same question that President Bush posed to the world the day after 9-11, are you with us or are you against us? And the question even America's allies now have to face is are they with the Americans in this economic Cold War or are they ambivalent? which is the Johnson, uh, Prime Minister Johnson's personal opinion about the 5G issue, and MI5's personal opinion, that's the British Intelligence Service, that you can actually have Chinese components in your system and at the same time ensure that the Chinese are not reading everything that you are writing. But I think that economic Cold War has begun already. And just as during the old Cold War, there was an arms race, a nuclear arms race. Today, there is another kind of arms race in terms of artificial intelligence. That is the biggest arms race of all. It involves only two countries, specifically the United States and China. Both think they'll win this arms race. It started already. And it's very important that we keep an eye on it. And this brings me to Russia. Russia is a power that under President Putin has moved increasingly, of course, against uh, the West since 2006, 2007. It reminds me very much of Donald Trump's America, actually, because the rhetoric from Putin and the rhetoric from Trump is remarkably similar. You just change the actors and the names. Putin tells uh, Russians that they are special and so does President Trump. He uses the term exceptionalism again and again, that we are different from everyone else, including our European allies. Putin uh, tells the Russian people that they are threatened, constantly threatened on a day-to-day -day basis by the West. And Trump tells the American people they are threatened by China and the Chinese. And finally, Putin says that Russia has been cheated since the end of the Cold War by the West. And Trump tells his base that the Americans have been cheated since the end of the Cold War by three riders, Western allies, who basically have done very little for the United States, but insisted that the United States does a lot for them. But there is a big, big difference here. And we have to be very frank. America is still the richest country on the planet and will remain so for a very long period of time. You should not underestimate the degree of American economic and military power. We have not seen its like before. And it may well be that China will become an even greater economic power in the years to come. But its poverty levels and environmental problems will mean it won't be quite in the same ballpark, I would say, for 10 or 20 years. And it is still to escape from a middle-income trap. It's in the process of trying to escape from that trap, which only two countries so far have successfully escaped. The second thing to remember, of course, is that America is the greatest military power that the world has ever seen, and that is not going to change for at least the next 10 years. It may not mean anything in real terms, just as being a great military power didn't mean much in real terms during the Cold War. It was all on paper. Not, neither side dared go to war against the other and test who was more powerful. And that may well be true of the United States and China. But the point that I'm trying to make is that Russia is a poor country. Its economy is marginally larger than Spain's today. 
It's not in the same ballpark. There is a downward spiral because of crony capitalism, which I identify, of course, with the Putin regime, but maybe identified with other things. And there's a very unhealthful idea of resentment in Russian society, which is constantly pandered to by the media and by the Russian government, that one is resentful of a great past that was lost at the end of the Cold War, to be regained in the future, but still resentful. Whereas the Americans are fearful, fearful of the future in the knowledge, of course, that the 21st century is not going to be the American century, whereas the 20th century was. These are both emotional states of mind that are unhealthy, particularly when you have two countries competing against each other. I'm reminded of an article that Vladislav Zurkov uh, published two years ago. And as you know, he's quite close to Putin intellectually, perhaps not politically. He wrote a piece called A Hundred Years of Solitude. We Russians are going to sulk for a hundred years because you in the West have rejected us and because the Chinese don't seem to be very interested in us. That's an unhealthy state of affairs. Well, what do you do if you find yourself in an economically disadvantaged situation, as Russia does, if you're President Putin? You have two choices. One is what I might call returning to the West, trying to do deals with the West, trying to get a better relationship with the European Union and the United States. And that is blocked off in the United States, not by Donald Trump, who wants a better relationship with Putin and is willing to make deals and always has been, but it's blocked by the Republican Party and it's blocked by both parties in the US Congress. And to a certain extent, it's blocked within the US military, but not by everyone in the US military. And the other, if you can't have a better relationship with the West, and that is not possible at the moment, is, of course, to throw in your lot with China and to have an alliance between Russia and China. And that is the nightmare. We mentioned dreams earlier this morning, the European dream. This is the nightmare that keeps people like Henry Kissinger awake at night, an alliance between Russia and China. We're not there yet. Dmitry Trenin, a very much respected uh, Russian uh, analyst, has said there is an entente between the two countries, which falls far short of an alliance. But I think you can see that an alliance is beginning to emerge very slowly. We see it in a very large Chinese investment in Russia. There hasn't been much Western investment since Ukraine in 2014-15. There's been $100 billion of Chinese investment in the Russian Far East. We in Europe talk about pipelines, which make Europe dependent on Russian energy, but there are also pipelines being built in the Far East with Chinese money that are going to tie Russia and China together in a kind of energy community. Large exchanges of military hardware now, including the top secret uh, programs that uh, you still produce, because you are a leading uh, defense uh, economy country, being given to the Chinese. And I think most interestingly in all, what's been called stress testing America's allies in Asia. That is just testing whether the United States is willing to come to their aid or not. And the first example of this you saw last year was South Korea, when there are now joint patrols, Russian-Chinese air patrols in certain parts of East Asia. And one was a Russian uh, uh, aircraft that went into South Korean airspace and the South Koreans had to escort the Russian plane out, but not before firing 360 shots at it, by the way. Not aiming to knock it down, but just firing 360 shots. It's a lot to get one aircraft out of your airspace. We're going to see more of that. So that's Russia. It brings me to the fourth uh, point, uh, Europe. And uh, geopolitically, I want to talk about Europe. I don't want to talk about Europe economically or politically. 
And the geopolitical problem for the Europeans was stated at the Munich Security Conference, but not last year, but the year before, by uh, Juncker, in which he said, we need to develop a meaningful role in the world. Because at the moment, we are ignored, unlike China and the United States. And that is a challenge for the European Union, to develop a meaningful role. And it's a particular challenge now that the United Kingdom is leaving. Because there are only two European countries that do grand strategy, that think globally in strategic terms. One is France, and the other is Britain. And so losing Britain, I think, is a challenge. And that is why President Macron has said, we can't afford to lose Britain which is why he's talked about setting up a European Security Council of which Britain would be a full and equal member to the European Union. And I think that is actually the future. The future is European. The British are going to move nearer to Europe, but they're going to work on a more ad hoc, which is very British basis, with European allies because the French, and to some extent the Germans, recognize that the EU without the UK geopolitically is in a very invidious position. The EU has also woken up to the fact that China is now a player in Europe for the first time. I was uh, at a, a meeting of the Italian uh, Institute of Foreign Affairs and they're writing a report for the Italian government and the unofficial title of the report is a question. And the question is, is the Eastern Mediterranean becoming a Chinese lake? Because if you look at the Port of Piraeus, now owned by the Chinese, if you look at the biggest naval, not naval, sorry, commercial uh, uh, base, uh, not base, but port, which the Chinese are building in Turkey, southern Turkey, if you look at Chinese penetration of Cyprus, if you look at the fact that Italy has now joined the Great Belt and Road Initiative, not very seriously, I think, but still, it's indicative. If you look at the fact that Athens and Budapest, there's going to be a rail link between those two, which is financed by the uh, Chinese, you suddenly have woken up to the fact that China is inside Europe. It's even inside the European Union, because there are countries like Hungary that have vetoed EU uh, EU um, statements on Chinese human rights, for example, or what's happening in the South China Seas, because they don't want to irritate the Chinese. The Czech president has said, and I quote, that he wants his country to be an unsinkable aircraft carrier for Chinese investment in Central and Eastern Europe. So no wonder, I think, that the European Union has begun to see China as a challenge, let's not say a threat, but a challenge that now needs to be taken seriously. My fourth remark is that the European Union lives in the most dangerous neighborhood in the world. And it's not just the Middle East, which has made almost no progress since the Arab Spring, and in fact, if you look at opinion polls in, in those countries which had made progress, such as Tunisia, you find that there's the greatest support for Islamist parties, not for the kind of democratic secular parties that the European Union likes so much. And one of the most repressive countries in the Middle East is now Egypt, which of course was one of the beacons uh, in, back in 2011 for the Arab Spring. No, the real fault line that runs uh, between Europe uh, and the Middle East runs through Europe, not outside. Sigmund Freud was asked uh, in the last month of his life, he died in London in exile in 1939, a few months after the beginning of the Second World War, he was asked by a journalist, is this Europe's last war? And he said very cynically, it's my last war, but it's probably not yours. I was moved to become an academic. I was a businessman originally because I crept out at uh, 
the lunch hour once and bought a book by an American historian called Europe's Last War, which was about the Second World War. It was published in 1976. And we all like to congratulate ourselves that Europe had seen the end of war. Indeed, in 2012, the European Union was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for preventing, and I quote, a war in Europe since 1957. But what is this Europe we're talking about? Because there was a war in Bosnia in the 1990s. There was a Kosovo war, which you and Russia remember, I'm sure, quite well. And that was just before 2012. And if you go to Bosnia today, there is the prospect of another Bosnian war. And Bosnia is one of the most depressing places on the planet. Youth unemployment in Bosnia is 60%, which is the highest in the whole world. You have three different communities who've locked each other out, who go to separate schools, who read separate history textbooks telling different stories. We heard about storytelling this morning. We find a society on the edge, ready to explode. And there are many people in NATO, you hear it all the time when you go to Brussels, who say our next mission is likely to be back in the Balkans sometime soon. That may be too pessimistic, but it's there. But there are two other fault lines that run through Europe, two other fault lines that are European. One actually runs through European cities, like Bradford and Brussels. And we're talking here about the integration of migrants, majority of whom are Muslim, but not all, by the way. If you want to be pessimistic about migration, well, go and ask Emmanuel Macron, who has talked about the European Union facing an existential crisis. His existential crisis is African immigration coming in future. The UN projection is 200 million people from Africa coming to Europe between now and 2050. That's a United Nations projection. But it's one that Macron has officially adopted, and it's one that the new president of the European Commission has adopted. In fact, in her first speech she gave, or one of her first speeches, she said that the main commissioner for migration in the European Union should perhaps have his position renamed protector of the European way of life. Now, these speeches are fascinating. And whether you buy into these statistics or not, there is no doubt at all that migration is going to be the biggest challenge that the European Union has to face in future. And how it tackles that problem is going to be central to its survival. And the other fault line runs through Ukraine and divides Ukraine from west and east and runs through the Baltic states. And it's a fault line that was identified by President Medvedev when he was president when in a press interview he talked about a zone of privileged, privileged civilizational interest. Yes, the language of civilization again. But these countries, the Baltic states and Ukraine, fall within our civilizational zone. And everything outside to the west falls within the European Union's civilizational zone. And we have no problem with that. And we can have a perfectly acceptable and positive relationship with the European Union if they accept that this is the fault line that runs through Europe. And someone like Donald Trump, of course, he doesn't speak for the European Union, would be very happy, probably, to accept that. But the US Congress certainly is not, and the European Union is not. And that's what makes a relationship between the two very difficult. And as I come to my last, you'll be relieved to no point, which has to be the environment which as far as my students are concerned is the only matter of any interest that they really have. They're not interested in a great power war between China and the United States. They should be, but they're not. And they're not really interested in local wars in the Middle East. They should be, but they're not. They are interested in the environment. Well, as I tell them, from my point of view as a geopolitical uh, observer or analyst, the environment is very important too. It's opening up uh, new areas of contestation in the Arctic, which is the next theater of conflict between Russia and the West. And it has already produced 
uh, a war in Syria, which was produced by four years of drought. Yemen, a humanitarian crisis. Sana, a capital city of Yemen, which will close in 10 years' time because it will run out of water. The first capital city in the world to close, and probably not the last. We are already seeing how environmental degradation is fueling conflict, civil wars within countries, and potential conflicts between great powers. So let me end by saying, what's the takeaway? If this was some business convention and you were paying a vast amount of money to hear me speak, what's the takeaway I would leave you with? I think the world order is disintegrating, but I think it's also being rebuilt from the bottom up this time, not from the top down as it was last time. And what do I mean from the bottom up? I mean, look at what the Chinese are putting together. The new institutions in Asia, infrastructure development banks, things like the Belt and Road Initiative. These are initiatives that are bringing countries together, are integrating regions, are powering globalization. But there isn't any master plan, and I don't believe the Chinese have a master plan for the Great Belt and Road Initiative, but these are happening. It's happening from the bottom up, and that's not a bad thing, by the way, but it's new. And the world's leaders haven't seen that type of thing before. The second is the capitalism is the only model. And it's very sad if you're a socialist. It's very sad if you think capitalism is responsible for global inequality on an unacceptable scale. But it is the only model. There is no other major country offering an alternative to capitalism. China is the most important market for uh, luxury goods. It's the second largest uh, number. It has the second largest number of billionaires in the world. It will soon surpass the United States in having more billionaires. I suspect the first trillionaire will be Chinese, not American. It has the world's biggest and growing middle class. And it also stages, by the way, the biggest shopping event every year in the world. Oh no, the Chinese are capitalists but it's a different kind of capitalism from American and from European. And there's a contest, yes, between free market economies and command economies. And we don't know which is the most effective and efficient at delivering wealth. We still don't know that. It's a fast developing situation. But the real challenge, I think, comes from this. Can we survive a post-hegemonic world? That is a world in which there isn't a hegemonic power. The 19th century was uh, the British century. The 20th century was the American century. I don't think the 21st century is going to be the Chinese century. I believe it's going to be nobody's century. And that is a historic challenge in 200 years. Nobody will actually be managing or claiming to manage world events. And why is this important? Because perhaps you say it doesn't matter. Perhaps it's a good thing that there is no hegemon. Well, read a book by Ian Bremmer from the Eurasia Group called A G Zero World, in which he argues that a world without a hegemonic power may be a world that doesn't have a governing principle a governing set of ideas, a dream, if you like, of where it would like the rest of the world to go. And his final point is, it would be a world which has a global governance gap. A global governance gap. And such a world is one that we could have survived very happily in the 19th century, and possibly even in the 20th century. But given the environmental catastrophe which we are facing, is the worst possible prospect. If there isn't a leading power leading us out of this, can we escape? Of course, the irony is that the largest polluters on the planet are both China and the United States, and neither of them are fully written up and signed up to dealing with the global catastrophe. The European Union is probably ahead of the field but it doesn't have that leading role, as Juncker rightly said.
that gets other countries to listen to what it has to say, and it doesn't seem to offer any longer a model for other countries to follow. Well, that's pessimistic, uh, it is. I think Edward Lucas is talking to you later this evening. He will be equally pessimistic, but in his own way. Uh, and hopefully tomorrow you'll get the optimists coming along and putting their position. But thank you anyway for listening, and if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to.